Welcome. I'm Pam Rickia from livingjoyfully.ca and today I'm here with Donna Anderson. Hi Donna. Hi, how are you going? I'm doing very well, thank you. Uh, I was actually introduced to you a little while ago through a podcast listener. So I am so excited to get to learn more about you and your unschooling journey. And to get us started, can you share with us a bit about you and your family and what everybody's interested in right now? Just a little snapshot. Yeah, sure. Um, so in my family, we have myself and my husband. We've been together um, about 20 years now. Uh, we've known each other that long. Uh, we've got two boys. They're um, always unschooled and Liam is 14 and Quinn is 10. Um, we have our dog, Lucky. We're not sure how old he is. He's, he was a rescue dog, so I don't know, maybe he's seven or eight or something. But, yeah, he's a big part of our family. We've got some chickens and fish and, you know, the usual thing. Um, so we live in Australia, so I'm kind of ahead in time of you, aren't I? It's, um, it's morning here, evening for you. It's tomorrow. <laughs> um, it's, yeah, we're in tomorrow over here. Um, yeah, it's so a morning time. And we're in, in Queensland, sort of on the east coast of Australia, about halfway up. Um, we've lived here for about four years. We really love it. It's um, really great. It's a small city. It's still got that kind of country vibe and that people are really friendly, but everything's here that we want. Um, and we live kind of near the city in the suburbs. So we've got but quite a big, almost quarter of an acre blocks for, you know, the animals and the garden and all that kind of thing, but still only a few sort of case from the city, which is nice. Um, and we've moved around quite a bit. I don't know. We haven't really talked about that, have we? So. We, I'm from Sydney, well, my husband and I met in Sydney, I was at uni and working and stuff, and then um, we moved, uh, I went to Singapore, my husband went to Africa, and then we got, um, he was offered a job in Dubai, and we decided to move there together, and then we had Liam, then we moved back to Australia, then we went to the Netherlands, and now we're back in Australia again, so we've, yeah, we like travelling, and yeah. Um, yeah, so that's one of the interest that my husband and I have is that we when we first met we both said we both want to travel the world um so we have been able to move around a bit and travel um and oh I've got to go into some of the kids interests they're um it all kind of overlaps like I was trying to think here what are the interests um so our boys they're really really good friends um which is lovely and they have some common interests so they're both quite like RPGs sort of like tabletop RPGs but um also so like uh, video gaming RPGs um, and they both enjoy, actually all four of us like sort of martial arts stuff. So that's some of the like overlapping stuff. Um, Dungeons and Dragons, that's been a thing that they've been into for a few years now. Started off like we just played at home a little bit and then they got some games with friends going and, yeah, that's something that they're still really interested in. Um, Liam, yeah, he's been playing some RPG games lately. New one came out, Baldur's Gate. And he's playing a Star Wars RPG. Um, and he's really, he's such a great guy, 14. It's its fantastic. Um, he's really lovely, funny guy, um, really interested in uh, history. Like he kind of dives deep into all these different time periods. And often it is through YouTube and games and movies. And, yeah, he knows so much. And it often ties into politics and other things and then it ties into his martial arts and kind of weaponry and his interest in medieval fighting. That's something he wants to kind of explore. You know how they do it, you know, modern times kind of dress up as the knights with the, yeah. So that's something that he's, you know, quite keen on. And D&D, he really loves. He reads a lot, you know, kind of fleshing out characters and writing about, you know, characters and stuff. Um Oh, and his martial arts, is, he really loves that. He's um, He's gone down. He's tried a few different types of Brazilian jiu-jitsu is what he's kind of set it on and been doing for a few years, and he loves it. He looks forward to it. He goes a couple times a week, um, has a really great bunch of guys that he trains with, um, and it's so cool seeing him just loving it and really, like, putting so much energy into it and, yeah, it's really great seeing that. Um, and Quinn, um, like as I said, there's some of those similar interests with D&D &D and RPGs and stuff. Um, he's really into animals as well. Um, so he spends a lot of time each day with our you know, dog and chickens. 
Um, and so do I, and so does my husband um, and Liam too, but he's really into animals and um, he was actually the the main driver in us starting to um, foster animals. So we've fostered some kittens and actually today he's super, super, super excited. We've got someone coming from the rescue group to check our boundaries and like do the little interview thing so we can foster puppies and dogs. So really, that's really exciting today. Um, and oh, it's, just, it's funny how like just that interest, it just brings in so many different things because like we take our dog for a walk and we meet other people with their dogs. So we've got to know neighbours through our dogs because they, they all say, oh, he comes lucky. Like it's almost like we don't exist, but he comes lucky like he's because <laughs> he's such a sweet, beautiful dog. Um, and then even things like he'll see sometimes, he notices things like he'll see, um, like we'll be walking and he'll go, oh, look at that nest. And I'm like, it's so far up. And we, we stop and we watch the birds and then we research like what kind of bird is that? Like I don't know. And I learn so much, things that... You know, you think you kind of know stuff about the world, but, yeah, I feel like I know nothing. It's so humbling, isn't it, being around kids and the things they're interested in. Oh, funny story. It's about the animal thing. Can I tell you? Yeah. Um, recently, I was a little bit sad in that we found a, um, we came, there was a, a possum that had sadly passed away. Um, I don't know, you guys, it's a ring-tailed possum, which is like kind of a little small marsupial thing. And, um Quinn um, remembered, luckily, that marsupials, you should check the pouch because, you know, just in case there's some babies. And I hadn't thought of that. I was just like, oh, that's sad. You know, what do we do? And then I said, we should check. And I was feeling a bit, you know, like, oh, I don't know. if I. But I did. And I thought, oh, gosh. And as, as I got close, I was like, yeah, there's definitely something there. And then, yeah, there was two little baby joeys, apparently they call them, little, little ones. And they were alive and... Um, yeah, we popped them out and I thought, um, so I used to be a, a midwife and I thought, oh, it's a little baby, you've got to keep them warm. And I thought, so just, we just popped them in our, under our top to keep them warm and then took them to um, to someone who could actually, you know, we did the phone call to the rescue. What do we do? We've got these yeah. little tiny baby possums. They looked really good though. They were like fluffy and looked super healthy. And, yeah, we took dropped them off to someone who could look after them. And Quinn was just so, he's like, oh. This is what I want to do. It's like I'm an animal, I can't remember the word he is, something like animal rescue hero or something. And he was really uh, just so stoked. And like I was as well, but just seeing him like super excited that he had. And I was like, that was amazing that you thought to check because I was kind of like, oh, it's sad. But then I didn't, I didn't, he was like, we've got to check, you know, the patch. And I was like, oh, are you going to check? And he's like, no. Are you going to check? And I was like, yes. I'll check. <laughs> sort of, I had to really like kind of psych myself up for it, but it was yeah, so amazing. And yeah, it wouldn't have happened unless he kind of said the thought of like checking. Yeah, um, oh, we've got so many other interests, but I, I could just like go on for <laughs> ages. <laughs> we the queen, I should mention, is really into mythology. <laughs> oh yeah, <laughs> we can just talk about our interests. Like, like this is our life. But mythology is like something that's. It's been a big thing, like Greek, Roman, Japanese, Chinese, Anglo-Saxon. And I, this was something I knew really nothing about, you know. Like I was like, oh, yeah, this is some Greek stories or something, but that's all I really knew. Um, but, yeah, he kind of, so that was kind of driven by him, even from when he was two, like just into, like started with the Disney, like Hercules, which he must have watched a thousand times, and then other like kind of mythology, and then he's got older and, I started reading about Greek mythology and I was like, oh, this is a bit full on. You know, some of it's really, you know, not really for little kids is what most people would think. But I was like, well, you know, we'll just, it's, he loves it. Let's just go there. Um, and we got, oh, gosh, there's audio books that we've listened to, some really great ones by Neil Gaiman and Stephen Fry. And, um, oh, um, and then even anime and manga, so much of that is references to Japanese mythology. So we've learned so much about that. And then Beowulf and... Norse mythology and he just knows so much about like all these you know the gods and goddesses and their stories and um and then it ties into like modern I guess different religions and how they explain how the world started and you can see all these connections and how it all overlaps and I'm like how can he be 10 and just have this incredible world view it's just it's amazing I didn't know that that's what you know life could be like I guess, but yeah, it is. Um, I guess I should, should mention the interests, my husband and I, because of course we've got 
stuff too. But yeah, I mean, I've started doing martial arts as well. I think I actually started before the kids. Um, so I go a few times a week to do that. And apart from that, yeah, my husband and I, I don't know, we have a good time together. We have our own business. So we work together, but we really enjoy each other's company and we're a great team. So we, you know, I guess parenting got us off to a good start working together. So yeah, we started our own business last year and um, it's been really awesome because he can be home more and more involved with our lives and um yeah and he's a really great guy he's really into history he loves playing like those uh what do you call it those strategy kind of games like total war and stuff Mm -hmm. the 14 year old they're both kind of into that some of like those political intrigue kind of games um yeah so we just and he loves cooking he loves the whole process of going to the shop choosing food for that meal finding new things we've never had before making a meal and I like doing the baking and like snacks and bread baking and cakes and pastry. I just love that. And I like gaming as well. Really love gaming with the boys. And they have surpassed me like years ago, but I still love it. I really love gaming with them. Um, and music. I play guitar and ukulele a bit, very much a novice, but, you know, I've dived in. Oh, Liam plays guitar a bit too, electric guitar. He has um, not so much songs. He really likes playing around and making cool sound effects and, and stuff. So... That's good, right? A bit more, I don't know, boring, you know, play a song and sing <laughs> or something. Um, yeah, gosh. And then volunteering. I volunteer for a local breastfeeding group and I'm doing my counselling um, qualification for that as well. And, um, yeah, I think that pretty much covers, like, <laughs> the main kind of things we're into at the moment. But it changes. You know what it's like, hey, there's always new something new to try and, yeah. You really just, I could let you go on forever and ever. That's why I, I didn't keep, didn't jump in because number one, when, when you're unschooling, like, look how full your life can be, right? All yeah. those different interests. And I love the way you shared, like, these are the, some of the interests that they share. These are some of the interests that they're pursuing on their own. And then we heard sometimes the ones that they engage with you and with your husband and like just everybody weaves in and out um, with each other, depending on what they're doing. Right. It's just it's just a beautiful example of just how unschooling flows in our lives. And we don't you know, when we have that time and that space like so many people say your kids don't go to school they must be so bored right Mm -hmm. like I mean I remember hearing that especially when my kids were younger and my kids heard that (laughs) and it's really not true because when you have the space to actually like think of something you're curious about and just do it right and just play with it whether you're you know making sound effects with it or learning songs like it doesn't matter it's just so fascinating and beautiful to watch them in action isn't it yeah yeah I love it and sometimes it's an interest comes up and it comes up for a week like I don't know but so and I actually and over the past year there's been lots of opportunities where you just you know have time to do even more time than usual which is awesome and like oh let's do some wood whittling and it just happened that someone said oh there's this really great person and they're selling like some kits and I was like cool let's do that so we started whittling and making different things with the timber we ordered these cool knives and that was really fun and then we just kind of put it aside and then and then drawing would be a thing so could it be like oh I want to get some new art stuff and he'd be like really into it and drawing a lot and just doing these amazing drawings and then he'd take a break and then I'll be like oh let's paint so then we get some paint and we'll be get some canvases and just you know paint stuff like I don't know I'm not you know an artist or anything but you know you just have a go you just do it and play around with colors and things and oh, there's so many things that kind of come in and out and sometimes you never know if it's going to stick right like you, you don't know like when Quinn first started watching Hercules yeah oh, I don't know I didn't know that was going to be something at 10 that he's it's kind of kind of become this common thread through his life I, I, it was like a Disney movie that we're watching and I was like oh it's got some you know at that time you know the kids be younger I was like oh I don't know how I feel about some of the themes in this doesn't matter though right you know we watched it and he watched it and watched it and watched it and it's become something that he's re- you know really into yeah so exactly that's, that's and an unschooling that's life a- I guess <laughs> 
you don't know until you're looking back and you start to see the threads through things. And it's, it's the same with things that they try out for a while. Like even if they don't stick for longer, they, while they were diving into it, they pick stuff up that they're keeping with them and that weaves into other things, right? Like it might, you don't know what they're getting out of say the drawing, right? It could be a a perspective thing. It could be an artistic thing. And, but you know, a few years down the road, you'll probably notice when you're looking back at the threads, like the little piece that they pick, maybe it's just like a critique piece. Like now they feel more comfortable critique, critiquing the art in a video game that they're watching or something, right? Because mm-hmm. they played around with it a bit. It's just so yeah. fascinating to see what they're drawn to no matter how long for, right? <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's really, yeah, you never know where it's going to go. And even something like video games, like I was talking to a friend yesterday and I was saying, I wouldn't believe it. We were just, I was driving somewhere with Liam because, you know, the car, there's so many cool conversations happen. But I had classic FM on, which is like, you know, it's more the classical music. And then just by chance, this guy came on, he's talking about video games. And I was like, this is unusual. It's normally just like, you know, they're talking about different concertos and things like that. And, and then he's talking about gaming. And then it was playing different songs and different games. And I recognised one of them. And my son's like, oh, yeah, that's that game. And it was the London Philharmonic. I can't remember what the game was now. It was an anime-based one. And... And just listening to this beautiful, beautiful music. And I was like, that's fascinating. And that ties in. Then I was talking to my son about Minecraft. And there was this really cool, um, uh, like a waltz that was playing once. And I was like, that's beautiful. And someone had written it. And I just knowing that in video games, you've got like um, directors. And because I don't even knew they were like movies, right? Like I was just like, I don't know what games are. They're like this separate little thing. But just this little thing that kids get into and apparently they're bad or something. But they've got like the game and the art, as you were saying. Like they've got artists uh, working, so many artists working in the game. And yeah, it's really like a movie. And the kids get to direct the movie in a way. They create a character which then interacts with other characters. And in some games, you can create a whole team of characters and they're all interacting. And it's like, oh, wow, they're actually. Like a, I remember in G mod watching them when they were quite little and they were together in Gary's mod playing and they because then you can you can just put in it's an empty world you just drop stuff in and they were creating this full thing and they they had like these robot things that were interacting it's like oh my gosh it's like they're making a little movie here mm-hmm. and it's it's like yeah it blows my mind the the things that I didn't know and now yeah just and just seeing how much fun they have and how capable they are and and how everything ties in together like the music and the art and how it all comes all into one you know just and that could just be from games and of course that's not the only thing they do like they explore so many different things oh I know it's so beautiful because once you're open to that and just kind of following your flow and and just what catches your eye so much of the world comes in it, you know, you can, because it's all connected. It's not sub- subject, you know, yes. divided into subjects that don't kind of cross over, but you hit so many things just by being curious, right? I mean, like yeah. within the game, there's just that whole spectrum of things, but within any interest, right? There is a whole spectrum of things. It's beautiful. Okay, I should probably go to the next question. Oh. But I mean, I love that because that's unschooling in action, right? That's why I love hearing about what families are up to and how they're flowing through things. It's just a beautiful example of unschooling in action. I would love to hear how you discovered unschooling and what your family's move to unschooling look like. Because you mentioned your boys haven't been to school at all. So you discovered it when they were younger? Yeah, yeah, pretty early. I mean, I've heard about homeschooling. Actually, when I was in high school, a kid had come to school who was um, who'd been previously homeschooling, and then that kind of threw all the stigma out the window because she was just this really cool, fun person. She knew so much. So I guess I kind of had the idea that homeschooling wasn't, you know, what everyone said it was. So I guess it kind of had a positive start. Um, and then, yeah, I didn't hear about unschooling though until after Liam was born. Um, 
but I had, I, I guess it kind of started with attachment parenting, like a lot of people do that. So I had been a midwife and worked with family. So I had the academic kind of background of knowing about attachment theory and knowing that like a really warm, close connection to, to children, it gives them a really great emotional start and creates this wonderful secure base and they can explore the whole world. And when you think about it, like that's kind of the basis of unschooling, right? <laughs> so I guess that was where I was coming from. <laughs> and, I, and talking to parents and families about that, even though I didn't have kids, but I thought it, it makes sense. Like there's some good research behind it, which people like to hear, but I was like, yeah, that makes sense. And then um, so when our son was born and then it just kind of flowed, like he was born, he was born at home and we just kind of, you know, snuggled with him and fed him when he wanted to and he was this new little person and we got to know him and my husband was way more natural than me. I was like naturally, I guess, uh, able to uh, a parent or something. I don't know. Like I kind of thought, oh, isn't it wrong like to have him in bed with us? Like I know the research, but I'm just feeling like, I don't know. And he was like, stick him in bed. No, that's fine. Like we were kind of snuggled in bed together and getting to know him as an individual and stuff. So I think it kind of started with that and then, you know, breastfeeding and stuff. And then as with friends and stuff, you know, or just that general pressure of, oh, look, you've got to start making them eat this or not breastfeed and wean them and then they start crawling and getting into things and people are talking about discipline and you know, like how to like manage and corral them and stuff. And I'm thinking, this isn't feeling right, but I didn't really know what was, what do I do next? Now that he's getting into the world and exploring, and he's looking at the pot plants and pulls the plant out. And I was like, I love that he's exploring and curious, but I kind of like that plant in the pot. Like what, <laughs> what, and I really, like, I was kind of like, I knew there was the way that everyone, like that I should be. Yeah. But I was kind of like, I want to do something different. And I was talking to a friend. She's like, yeah, you sound like an unschooler. I was like, what is this? What, what does that mean? <laughs> and it was, I remember Janet and I remember talking to her. Oh, we were in Dubai and she was back in Sydney and um, so I don't know what that is. She said, check out Sandra Dodd, go on her Yahoo group. Don't dive in asking questions or writing stuff. She said, just read bits and just see if it fits. And I was like, mm, okay. And I checked it out. And I was like, oh, yeah, okay, that's. I could see how it kind of it felt right, but I don't know. It felt like these are just people on the internet. Like no one I know is doing this, and I don't know <laughs> if if this is what we should be doing or not. But yeah, I guess he sort of got older, and then a friend was saying that she was going to homeschool and she was a teacher. And I was like, oh, yeah, I've heard about that. That's definitely not something I'm going to do. But I want to unschool and then send him to school when he comes to school age. You know. So, but then at this point, you know, he just watching him learn and it just I could see that he was, you know, he was learning to speak and, and to walk and interact with the world and it was all just from us supporting him and I was like, well, yeah, why can't he learn everything just by us keep doing, if we just keep doing the same thing? So I guess, yeah, so I heard about unschooling and it was radical unschooling which I'd heard about first and that felt right because I'd been going a bit along to um, like La Leche League because I was overseas at the time and I don't have that in Australia but and that was very much about, you know, like partner with your child, get to know them. and um, So I guess it felt right. And then when it came to the academic stuff, I guess as he got older and kids started going to school and that was when I think the de-schooling really started. It felt pretty natural up until then. Then I was like, whoa, hang on a minute. And then at first I thought, oh, unschooling must be that we teach them stuff but in like a tricky, fun way. So... I'm going to start, like, the kids at school are starting to write stuff so I can just make it fun somehow and make him write his name or whatever. And just seeing that he had his own ideas, he was like, yeah, no. Uh, he was just not going to, in a four-year-old way, I remember that when I was like, no, let's learn to write your name and we're going to make it fun and we're going to sing songs. And he was just like, nope, I'm just going to, like, <laughs> you know, I want to do drawing and then I want to go and climb that and then I'm going to go over on my scooter and it's like, oh, and I get frustrated. And then I would go back and see you know, read about stuff. And so every time I'd, I guess I'd come to kind of a hump and then go, this is not working. It's not right for him. It doesn't feel right for me, but I feel like I should. I should be doing this thing that others are doing. And, yeah, so that was, I guess that was how it started. And then we, we kept going because life was awesome. And I knew that um, school was there, like if we needed it or if he wanted to go. And then with Quinn, very different kid, but also similar beginning to his life and you know get a bit of a head start don't you as the next kid comes along but I thought he's probably going to go to school because he's like he's just such a different person I thought yeah he's going to love it he's going to love school and then as it got closer to school age I guess why would he go because he saw his brother was having fun like he 
and and then he he didn't really want to go either. It wasn't like a formal discussion, but I did want them to know that school was there if they wanted to go, and I didn't want to bad mouth it or anything in case they ever needed to go. But um, yeah, I didn't want to. I, I guess we kind of do make a decision for them in a way, don't we? Because we know a little bit more than them, but um, they never, they haven't ever really wanted to go. They're, they're not really, they've had friends who've gone to school, they've heard about it, they ask me, look, what happens? We can, you know, I try and answer their questions and stuff neutrally and, yeah, they're just not that kind of super interested in it, I guess. So that's, and that's fine. Probably they won't be. I mean, 14 and 10 now and, yeah, we've been unschooling all this time and, yeah, just having a really good good, good life and enjoying it. And we've moved around a bit, which I guess kind of helps because they probably would have, if they did go to school, they probably would have been in several different mm-hmm. schools um, by now, which I guess would be much fun. But, yeah, it's, um, I guess that's how we got into unschooling and we're, <laughs> yep, still doing it. Yeah. yeah. I, love, I love your point about not... Um speaking bad or demonizing school, you know, as well, because, you know, that, that can take away their feeling of, of choice as well, you know, um, on, on one hand that they might feel, like you said, they ask you questions about it, you guys have conversations about it, so that they, they understand, you know, even though it doesn't need to be like, it doesn't need to literally be a choice that you talk about, it's just that they know it's there. Yeah right? And they know they can come to you and chat about it and have those conversations. Whereas if we were super negative about it, um, you know, then they might feel less willing to come to you to talk about it. They might feel like they don't really have a choice that mom thinks it's really bad or, or whatever. And then plus if, if your family circumstances change, you know, that you can't predict and school becomes part of your lives for a while, you know, if it was demonized, yeah. they may be fearful of it or they may think mm-hmm. that, you know, they're taking yeah. a down step, you know, but it, it's something as a family you can work through as well because you don't need to bring all the whole school thing home as well. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I thought that was that yeah. was a super cool piece of of the story and and very interesting how how you um came to it like oh yeah that the should piece that uh, that was the other piece I wanted to touch on because you know when you're feeling like you should be doing something there's that dichotomy I know I should be doing some this thing but it doesn't feel right to me I find when I'm freezing something with I should be or I sh- I should do this or I should do that that was always a great clue to me that okay I need to look deeper at this <laughs> because <laughs> there was some sort of disconnect because I was feeling I should be doing something, but I didn't know why I didn't want to. I just knew it felt uncomfortable. So yeah. like you said, that was a time when I'd go back, I'd go reading, I'd go talk to people. I dive into that piece more. So yeah, I always found that to be a wonderful red flag for myself to just, when I noticed I was talking to myself that way, that it was time to dig into it a little bit more. Oh, yeah, for sure. And that reminds me of that wonderful article. I think it's on your website, Pam, about um, are you playing the role of mother? Is mm-hmm. that is that yeah. title? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I love that. I don't know when I first read it. It was, it was a good while ago. And, oh, my gosh, I just loved it. It so resonated with me. And I felt like this is like the root of you know, so many um, issues. I don't want to like overplay. It's not a big thing, but you know, when you like that whole thing, that should thing, like whenever there's been something that's come up, I'm feeling like, you know, like, oh, maybe, I don't know. I know other people do this and why do they do it? Am I missing something here? Or, but I really feel like the right path is different for my kids and I. And because I know every family totally different and we make choices for, you know, for what works best for our family. And then yeah, I would come back to exactly that, thinking, okay, there's that should, and that d- doesn't have to be the truth. Like, that's not not necessarily the truth. It's what is right for us, and and often it's different with each kid, right? Like how we, because we all with different personalities and different circumstances, and from month to month things kind of change. And so I've always found that 
if I wasn't sure about something, what I had to do was look at my kids and spend time with them, connect with them. If I was worried about something or whatever, just the answer always seemed to be just hang with the kids, connect, which we do a lot anyway. But you know when you're kind of with them but you're not with them? Yeah. Um, and that's when I find, oh, I kind of I catch myself going, oh, I'm worrying about something. And I was like, but they're right here. And then I would, you know, really, you know, be engaged with them. And I think I remember, was it Pam or something who wrote something that said you can be with your kids, but it's like when you're, um, when you're watching them, like, play a game, you can be kind of doing your own thing, which, you know, sometimes we do, and that's cool. But then other times it's when they, it's like when they kick a goal in soccer, when you're really, and they, you know, they achieve something or whatever, you're like, yes, and they're like, oh, no, you know, like those moments. When I'm in that moment and it's just kind of flowing and I can just see that they're fine, you know, and whatever the thing was I was worried about, I can just turn away from it and see it's not, it's not something most of the time, honestly, I'm sure there's times when it's something that I, you know, probably could change, but a lot of the time it's just me being concerned about something for outside reasons and it doesn't apply. I can just connect with them and see that they're totally, yeah, that mm. they're fine and they're loving life and I'm loving life and we're learning and it's all, it's all good. <laughs> I love the way you described it. I mean, that is exactly completely my experience as well. I know when I started to worry about something, it was often that like, so it takes a while. I get, I get faster at noticing, Oh, you know, you're worried about something. Mm -hmm. And that's when I realized, yeah, I was more um, just kind of almost phoning it in because what happens when you're worried, you start thinking about it more and more, right? And your head starts spinning a bit, yes. projecting mm -hmm. into the future, you know, oh, but you know, mm -hmm. what about if they never do this, blah, 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 right? And then every single time, like without fail, what helped the most was reconnecting with them. Just like yeah. you Thing, like actually connecting with like actually doing stuff with them purposefully hanging yeah. out with them cutting out the rest of the noises and just connecting because yeah. you see like you said they're happy this moment is great just keep stringing this moment together over and over and over and you know you're going to be six months down the road you're going to be a year yeah. down the road and things are going to be as good as they are in this moment and this moment is awesome and that's when you see oh yeah look they are you know they are learning things they are doing things they are happy you know because you don't know yeah. when you get sucked out of that connection mm -hmm. then start yeah. hearing those other more conventional voices yeah. louder yeah. And then you yeah, start yeah. spinning and then, and then all of a sudden you want to think about it more. You want to worry about it more. You want to think and you're stepping away from them a little bit. Right. Which just makes it spin harder. So always going back to them whenever I yeah. was, was the answer. I love that. <laughs> now you talked I about love that. I love how you said this moment is great. Like that's often the feeling. Yeah, I mean, we're just freezing up a little bit there. But um, so you were talking yeah, about yeah. some of those shoulds that you encountered every once in a while. Um, as, and that de-schooling really came once your eldest, um, once Liam hit school age, right? Because now, yeah. now that's when those voices are coming in stronger, right? Because now there's like real expectations on school age kids. They have their job to do, right? They're learning mm. to write their names and, and all that kind of stuff. So I was just wondering if you could chat a bit about what you found one of the more challenging aspects of de-schooling and how you worked through that. Mm, yeah, I think um, I think when I look generally at de-schooling, I, I don't know, I think it's been really great. Like learning about how people learn is really, it's really fascinating, right? It's really cool because <laughs> you kind of come from this place of, yeah, school is where you go to learn. But then when you take that out, you sort of think, oh, hang on, how do we, how do we learn? And then, yeah, that's that's been really, I don't know, I mean, when I think of it overall, there's definitely been a tricky part. I think, yeah, that is really cool. I remember my husband and I talking about stuff like how we learn to ride a bike or how did I learn to crochet or whatever, or even like computer stuff. Like we didn't learn that in school. Like a lot of that stuff we started I guess at uni, and they don't say to you, look, this is how you use a computer. You just kind of dive in, right, and you get stuck. You might look on YouTube or whatever, but, yeah, you just kind of, and I was thinking, oh, yeah, so we can, like, we can learn that stuff. And then we had moments of, I remember thinking, um, 
yeah, like about, like I was saying before about Liam writing and a lot of it was coming from feeling that, um, that he might feel ashamed or something that he wasn't able to do it. And I didn't want to be causing that. Um, but then when I dug in deeper, I sort of thought, hang on, what was my experience at school of writing? And I thought, well, actually that feeling of shame is only for me because I remember being at school and oh, just wanting to run and play, but having to write and it was quite strict. It, and I remember one of the teachers were quite strict, say pens up and you'd have to hold up your pen like this to show you had the correct grip because there's only one way to write, you know. Um, <laughs> and then I remember being sit, sitting next to a boy who, who found writing uh, more difficult um, and then I was supposed to show him what to do and tell him and for back into the why did I feel this kind of um this kind of you know like feelings that I had to kind of pressure him into like writing stuff I yeah when I dug back into my own school and stuff I thought yeah there's stuff there it's my stuff it's not his stuff I'm not going to put it on him um and could kind of step away from it um and I remember a really big kind of de-schooling hump I guess for me was Sandra Dodd actually came to Australia and um this was uh yeah it was probably about the age that Liam would have been starting school and you know how you kind of think you get it like there's all these different types of yeah I, we, we're doing it we're, we're cool we've got this um and then you go wow actually that's <laughs> you kind of get you know shocked by something but yeah so going along and chatting to her listening to her chat and I met Joe Isaac there I think you've chatted to Joe she's really awesome that was I think I kind of knew her online before that but didn't but actually met her there she was fantastic um, um Kai and Liam are similar ages and then talking to Sandra and I brought up like the handwriting thing and of course it's different layers right there's actually been a hole and actually write something and then there's the actual composing and putting your thoughts and I kind of wasn't so concerned interestingly about being able to write I don't know big papers or whatever because I could see that was conversation and developing ideas and thoughts and then putting onto paper you know would probably be computer because that's what everyone does right but the handwriting thing yeah that was interesting and I remember about that time I don't know where it was something on tv I saw an actor and he was holding his pen in a really unusual way and like signing stuff and I was like and obviously he's been doing that. He's an adult now, been doing that a long time. And I just started to notice different people who hold their pens differently and actually form their letters in different ways. There's not like one right way. Um, and I was like, yeah, come on, I can chill out about that. Like he's, you know, is <laughs> and how often do we actually handwrite stuff, really? It's like, yeah. Um, yeah. And then and now, of course, he's, um, you know, he can write stuff. And a lot of the time he's typing. And I see his typing skills are really amazing. You know, like he's 14. I wasn't able to, I certainly wasn't able to type like that at 14. He's quite fast and he can type things. And, um, yeah, I sort of look back and think, oh, you know, it, it was really internal. It wasn't about him. It was about me and my experiences and stuff. And I'm glad I, I don't think I did, you know, really put much of that kind of stuff onto him. But, oh, yeah, it would have been awesome if I could have avoided all of that. But, of course, you can't. Like, that's the journey, right? Like, we mm-hmm. do we do go through these things. Um, yeah. And, oh, yeah, reading, I remember, I remember my, in school, reading for me, I remember them saying, you know, you'll get there, you'll get there. And they're saying, oh, your reading's going great. And I was probably 12 by the time I was actually fluently reading. Like, I don't know. I know a lot of unschoolers say, you know, fluent reading is when you can, like, read most things, you know, like a kind of adult would I guess I was, guess I was about 12 and just feeling really inadequate about that in primary schools there's so much focus and so that was I guess watching the kids um learning to read because some kids learn to read like I've met people you know they learn to read at, you know like the kids are reading at like two three four five and um but then seeing Joe Isaacs sort of did like that informal kind of research and seeing that um, school kids learn to read at about you know similar ages to school kids but it does look different um yeah and then seeing that my uh kids like just seeing their reading um process I'm glad that I didn't kind of step in and be like that's it we're going to do something about this now you know I'm going to make sure that you know you're not reading by whatever the age is eight nine ten or whatever like you're not reading fluently we have to do something and so I've seen them just it's just 
a wonderful process from when they were really little, noticing letters and stuff, and then um, then coming on, you know, starting to read words, and then it's like whole sentences, then it's like books, and it's really it's really beautiful to see. But I do remember that was a thing, and it was the same like we we're talking about before. I get worried about something, and as you said, you notice it it's sooner. But I would be worried, and I'd be like, no, I'm just going to go and hang out with my kids. And I would see like in games, I was like, they're doing a lot more reading than we realize. And if they were in school, they'd probably be doing like, like those books where they just have like 10 words or something that they know. And they would just like be reading. And I was like, well, they're doing that in games. Like there's like, there's, there was probably even like when they were, you know, quite young, there'd probably be five or six words that they knew. And that was the foundation that they build on like with sounds or whatever. But yeah, that was, yeah, I think those were kind of the school things which were challenging for me, but I think it's, um, yeah, it's, it, it is tricky. I don't remember the, the other stuff, you know, like the, the whole life stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think I was, like we are talking before about the shoulds. Mm-hmm. I know when my son was sort of under one or under two, I was like, yeah, I'm going to be this, this I'm going to be the mum, you know, they're going to, he's going to, eat organic food because that you know that's going to keep him and it's going to be healthy and safe and there's not going to be any tv no tech and you know the wooden toys or you know like that was kind of the starting place for me my husband's like really okay you know and he would say look I think tv's fine and like games are fine and I'd be like yeah really are they and I was like you need to look at the research and then I would look at the research and I'm like right I'm going to read this critically it's there's really not any good evidence that you know any of this stuff hurts our kids like tvs and video games and things so I kind of had to that was difficult you know because I was really quite attached to the that idea like when they really lead all that video game to a bad but it really was coming from that place of good mums don't let their kids you know they limit things and um things that are bad and um I it didn't seem true for us you know like I could see once we started watching shows together started playing some games like watching I'm like watching Sesame Street and play school and I could just see it brought more into their world and it, it, it inspired me too, like to pl- to play with things differently. And we just got so many ideas. It's like, how's this? It's not bad. And, and then we went on to Minecraft, and then other games, and you know, Call of Duty. And it was just, I don't know. There was just so much. Um, yeah, when I was really honest with myself, and you know, being really authentically connected to my kids, it was all fine. It was re- it was better than fine. It was awesome. So I could see that it was yeah there was no need to limit stuff which was fun and that where there was learning and everything yeah yeah and it it really is that going back to them and seeing them in action because then you then you notice those words that they are reading right instead of standing five feet away going oh you're still playing that game right (laughs) (laughs) yeah 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 with them and you see you see them putting together the clues you see the next thing that they choose to do in the game you you see the critical thinking in action you see you know the early reading in action like when you actually are with them you see unschooling in action and Mm. that's when you get comfortable again right because it's like oh you know you can, yeah, and you can understand where those worries come from because you can, you know, after a while, like you said, it's, it's, it's so much our work to do when we come across those yeah. moments, right? It is us for us to figure out because our kids yeah. are doing what they're drawn to naturally. And that's what really is working with unschooling, right? So it's just so fascinating to be digging into that and those messages and understanding, you know, I see where you're coming from because, you know, you're looking at schooled kids, you're looking at kids that are, you know, don't have a lot of choice in their life, that are controlled, that are expected to do all these things and they're expected to do them on your time, on, you know, the parents of the teacher's time, to, you know, there's just so many constraints in their lives that you can see how they came up with the conclusions that they did, but they don't fit our life because that's not the way we're living in our life. That's not the way we're choosing to be together. It's not, we're not putting those extra constraints and controls on and we're loving where it's taking us. We just need to see that fresh again. Yeah. Right. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I can totally see why. I mean, if my kids needed to be up early to go to school, yeah, I imagine they'd need to get enough sleep. So they need to be, you know, in bed at a certain time and, you know, maybe they, they were only home for a few hours in the afternoon 
afternoon and but there's a lot to do like I don't know like eat and you know maybe spend some time together and then they'd want to be gaming like I can see how it's necessary to kind of you know allocate time for different things and to make sure they get enough sleep so they can get to school and things so yeah and it creates also I guess at school you know there's they're at school not able to do the thing maybe there was something they wanted to be doing at home that's waiting I remember that just wanting to get home to like build my go-kart or something yeah and then you just like dive in but then you had to stop again you know so yeah it does create it's that you know that marginal utility that Pam Sarishi talks about is if you can't get it then you want it more you know so I can see how it creates that kind of cycle do they want it so much that means you know that there's something wrong I have to to limit it more and then limiting it more they want it more and yeah yeah I can see definitely see how that how it happens and how some of those things yeah are, are necessary to a but they're not, you know, if you don't have school, then you don't have to be in bed at a certain time. You don't have to eat at a certain time. We don't, you know, it's. Yeah. At first you just think, you. oh, we're not doing school. But you, yeah. after over time, like a few months, years, you realize how pervasive that yeah. school mindset is in uh, just about everything. Like your life does a complete 180 eventually. Yeah. When you take that piece out, right? And that leads so nicely to our next question, because I wanted to talk to you about something that comes up um, pretty regularly in unschooling circles, which is building an unschooling nest, right? So yeah. now that we don't have all those constraints on us and the world is opened up for us, like, what are we doing instead? Because at first it seems so simple, yeah. like, I'm just going to build this nice environment, right? But there are so many different aspects to it, isn't there? Uh-huh. yeah oh definitely and I love like just the idea of a nest now we talk about nesting like when someone's pregnant I just love the idea of that and I think of birds making a nest you know they're making it more like safe and cozy and yeah. and nice and also practical right so it it works so yeah I love that idea and I remember um I think Joyce Federal she has this really great definition of unschooling where she talks about we create an environment where natural learning can thrive and I like for me that is about the nest because that environment we create is what um is, is why they can learn so well and that's what with humans that's how we tend to learn really well is when I guess our basic needs are taken care of and we're comfortable and that is yeah that's the nest for me and I think it's, I think I guess because we've moved a lot too it's been a reoccurring thing of you know recreating the nest and it's always looked different depending on you know ages and where we live and what kind of things we're into at the time but it's there have been like those reoccurring things where it's been um there's been the physical things of having enough like an abundance so you know enough computers so that we can you know sometimes we're playing a game but we need to google something and you know so having enough of everything and maybe they want to play that game but this game they want to have running in the background so they can be like building xp or something or maybe i'll be like i'll do some of the farming for them sometimes like you know in games where mm-hmm. it's like um you know it's, it's that really boring farming component like, i'll do that and you go into that game so with it you know farming and stuff so which i guess is one of the elements of support like that's often a thing where there's that they feel supported in their interests and stuff and knowing that I see it as uh, it's important to them. Like I guess it might not look important on the outside. I'm just doing, I don't know, like this five, but to them it's super important and I'm loving it and I'm connecting with them, which is great. Um, but I think a lot of the nest, I often think about it not so much as a physical, even though it is physical space, but it's also the um, like that emotional stuff. I keep coming back to that and like when I was saying about attachment parenting and it doesn't stop, like creating an environment where they feel really, you know, like respected, and safe um it feels kind of like this um bubble or I guess more like like this really strong foundation so when they feel safe and respected and heard and validated and really emotionally secure and knowing that we've got their backs that you know we're their cheerleaders we're this good partnership a really good team then then they feel safe enough to I guess to take those risks which often happens with learning sometimes you just need to take a bit of a risk or um or you just feel comfortable enough to explore whatever whatever it is and it's stuff like there's all that emotional stuff which is oh that I think that's something that we really build like as parents as unschoolers we build some really great listening and noticing skills because kids 
um, especially when they're little, they don't necessarily say, oh, gee, I feel like I'm getting a little bit hungry and I might be heading into the hangry soon, so why don't we grab a snack? Like that's, you know, you've just got to kind of notice the little things and go, oh, I think I might be grabbing some snacks pretty soon. You, you know, you might just slide in, you know, a little platter with some nibbles on it or something and or you might f- just feel like there's a little bit of tension building and you think they're a bit frustrated but, you know, I'm here and they're really pushing to get whether it's like in a game or something, like that's part of learning. You get to that point where you're frustrated and you don't know quite, you know, you don't, you're not going to necessarily jump in and stop it, but sometimes they do need more support and sometimes they don't. And feeling that um, and learning, because we learn too, right? Like, is it, should I step in or is it just my discomfort that makes me want to step in? Should I right now be here with them? But, um, prepared to I don't like there's so many different options like sometimes it is right to step in and say hey um, do you want me to look for a walkthrough or often as they're older now they say oh no I'm really stuck in this part of the game can you have a go at it actually that doesn't happen that much it used to I've got some pride there I've still got some, <laughs> it used to happen that I could actually help them in a game like get through a tricky bit nowadays it's like I'll look up a walkthrough or I'll watch it on YouTube or something and they'll just be like that, that little piece that's you know, that they that we might have missed or something. And because the games they play now, my goodness, they're, they're hard, they're challenging. And, yeah, and it's all those little things that we do to support them, right? It's the emotional stuff, but it's also the, the food or sometimes, you know, getting a bit antsy and you think, do you want to duck outside for a bit? Sometimes a change of scene is just the thing that we need and or it might not be. And so they know they're free to be like, yeah, nah, or whatever and they and then seeing them as they get older like Liam 14 now like seeing that he does it he can he's doing that more like he's kind of picked that up over time like he'll sort of notice if he's feeling I don't know whatever he'll say you know I'm gonna you know maybe he'll want to go for a walk or he's really looking forward to going to martial arts because he wants to get you know some of the energy out or if something's feeling uncomfortable in a relationship kind of thing he'll he'll just be um like I'm just gonna duck out and get some air or you know just those little things that you can just you know take a a moment which is yeah I really really love that um but I often think too not the practical things I was just thinking about that with my kids how they've got their room set up differently and then we have shared space and one kid I guess it's the problem solving stuff as well because like maybe one person wants it to be a bit cooler or a bit warmer or they like the blinds open or shut or they want bright light like those things are often a big part of the, you know kind of creating that kind of good learning environment aren't they so and it's often different so there can be like one person wants this someone wants something different so yeah the problem solving skills I think and being creative and finding a solution that hopefully can you know yeah that can make everyone feel comfortable yeah yeah no I love that I love that because and I think that that emotional space you were talking about and um for us to offer like ideas, the piece I want to get to is is the non judgmental piece. As in, we're not bringing our judgment; they don't feel judged because that's when they feel free to try things out, right? Yeah, to play, yeah. To, play to to you know explore this thing, and it's okay if it goes wrong. Nobody's going to judge them. Like having that safe space where they can explore without like I feeling like somebody's watching over them and, and judging what they're doing. That yeah. I think is, is a huge piece of it. And also, like you said, with, so that they can say, no, that's not going to work for me. You know, do you want to go for what? And so we can offer up all, all these different possibilities and it is so beautiful, isn't it? Because they pick and choose the ones that work for them in the moment and they're learning the things that work for them. And yeah. eventually they start to recognize it and do it for themselves, right? Like you were yeah. saying, like you, you'll see Liam make these choices now without, you know, you stepping in. And as you were talking about, I, I like to, I think of it kind of as that dance with them because yeah, oh. any given moment in the exact same situation, yeah. with different days, maybe even different hours, we do different things in that yeah. moment, right? Because yeah. each moment is unique, to, to mm. us, to what's going on, right? Even if it lo- on the outside, it looks the same. We are yeah. in different places. 
yeah, right? Yeah. So how we react, where we come and just knowing them to that level of detail, like in, in your nest, right? Knowing yeah. that they haven't eaten in a while, knowing that they didn't get much sleep last night, mm-hmm. knowing that this is something that they really, really, really want to accomplish. So, you know, they may be uh, able to push through some more frustration than they typically would. Like all those little yeah. pieces and understanding yeah. that, that yeah. is is the nest that you're making. And that's that dance. And the great thing about not having that judgment piece is mm. that it's okay when there's a misstep, right? There's going to be steps. That is totally okay. Oh, yeah. And when you don't have that judgment of the misstep, you can mm. take another step. And see if that works yeah. in where you step back for a little bit and then try try a different way. You know, the, yeah. it's just it's just so beautiful to see it in action, even even when it goes wrong, even when we're not quite sure what to do, because we keep yeah. connecting and we keep trying, right? Yeah, yeah. And for sure, like we do, we get it wrong. Like I know, like one of my kids appreciates, you know, like a bit of a lighthearted approach and a bit of a joke, and the other kid, no. Like, a, a, but then also it changes, right? So it's just yeah. feeling around. And sometimes I say something I'm like, oh my gosh, like, and then, but then later I can go back and say, look, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry I said that, you know, I was distracted or I was, you know, worried about something or whatever was going on. Or I don't even have to explain. I'm just like, hey, I'm, I'm really sorry. And it's authentic. And you, and a lot of the time, like, oh, you know, that's fine. Because I guess it's not all the time. So just like, yeah, that was, it was a bit unusual, mum, but, you know, but it's fine, you know, it's, yeah. And I think developing those kind of skills, whether it's, you know, communicating and being able to apologise and and even with things like listening to them, I found that's something I've really had, you know, I've developed and it's been really great. And I think it's one of those things that makes it feel like I'm not, sometimes I feel like I'm not doing anything. Like it's just kind of flowing because it's, I guess, over like over a decade now, just doing it all the time, starting to become second nature Mm-hmm. And there's still times when, but we always fine tuning. I don't know if you find that. Like even like I'm saying to my kids, I guess as they're getting older, there's um, some things that they want to talk about, which I've been through, and I want to tell them like how to fix it. You know, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I don't like I, you know. It's like listening and, and things because I, I remember being a teenager. It wasn't that long ago? <laughs> yeah, it was quite a while ago. But yeah, I'll be <laughs> listening, thinking, yeah, yeah, and and I just say, look. After a while, like not interrupting or anything, I say, "Did you want me to like bounce some ideas off you, or you're happy with me listening?" Or maybe I say, "You know, do you want a hug?" Or maybe we're hugging, and no, like I'm so glad you're able to tell me that, or whatever. But it's always like that fine tuning, and I want to sometimes step in and give advice. I'm finding that's coming a lot up a lot for me recently, and I'm thinking, no, like that's sometimes it comes across as judgment because. You're saying, oh, in that situation, you could have done this. But no, like often the thing to do is to listen. And they find solutions which I wouldn't, I wouldn't even think of. Um, and I'm learning from, from them. Like the way they set boundaries may not be to, you know, say it out loud or something. They might just be like, oh, I've got to go and do this. And that they'll remove themselves from the situation or I don't know. They have different ways of, of dealing with things, which I think, I, I do kind of notice a bit of judgment. I'm like, no, hang on, this is this is working for them, and you know, maybe I can I can learn something from this as well. Yeah, it really is. It's that level of trust that mm. we have for them, right? Mm. Um, that we fall back on in those moments because when you take that moment to think, you realize, you know, that may have worked for me when I was around that age in a similar situation, but it was a different situation. It was different people. I was a different kind of person. Like they've grown up very differently from the way we have. Right. Yeah. And they have a level of self-awareness of themselves and their needs and lots of experience with interacting with other people, just from interacting with you Mm. and your husband and siblings over the years. Right. That, Mm. So often when I gave that space, it is important to have that um, open space, right? So they know they can come and chat when they're ready. They can bounce ideas off. But yeah, Yeah. to not step in while they're still thinking and figuring it out, because then we kind of take over it. And yes, absolutely. They can feel judged if we're, even if we're not meaning 
we just want to share it. Mm. It, it can be taken that way just because like, well, why are you sharing it right now? I'm still thinking, mm. right, about my situation. If you're yeah. sharing what you did in, in what you think is a similar situation, maybe you're expecting that I should do something similar, yeah. or you know. So yeah. thinking about how they received it, they might receive it, is an important part of choosing mm-hmm. what we're going to share, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> uh now uh, you've been unschooling for a few years right <laughs> since since before they hit school age and life definitely has its ups and downs and you've mentioned that you guys have traveled quite a bit um so I thought I'd like to hear a little bit about how you found unschooling when you're going through those bigger changes or those bigger challenges that life throws at you have you found unschooling to be helpful in those circumstances yeah uh, yeah I think so when I, I've definitely um I think traveling I guess there's that kind of traveling when you're on holiday which can bring up kind of stuff but then like moving interstate or moving to another country um yeah it's quite it's quite a lot and there's I think a lot of the what I think of like ups and downs I think it's usually like us as parents like when our resources um stretched you know, yeah. because not enough sleep or just having too many balls in the air and trying to do all, you know, do all those things. And then noticing, oh, that I'm, we're not um, quite as available for our kids as we normally would be. And sometimes it's not like, um, and often, you know, they'll be fine because they get a lot of time with us, you know. And then if there's moments where we're feeling a little bit distracted or doing other things, it's very brief. Um, but yeah, usually I find it's noticing within ourselves and, and, um, yeah, and taking care of ourselves whilst we're also, you know, take, doing our normal family stuff and being with our kids, which is like, you know, that article we mentioned before of yours is that we can look after ourselves and, you know, and our children at the same time. It doesn't have to be a, a separate thing because yeah. I think when we get this idea of, you know, if we're feeling stretched, then we need to go away or be away from them. But they, like, this is our life. We you know, don't need to be away from our, you know, our life, hopefully, like we can still be, you know, in, really engrossed in it. And I don't know, I'm imagining for a lot of families at the moment, like this past year, it's been pretty full on, hasn't it? So mm-hmm. we're probably, people are probably in different places of feeling stretched, you know, emotionally and mentally and stuff and our finance stuff. And yeah, we've definitely had that going on and other families I know have as well and probably people all over the world who were doing that. And we've um, had, uh, unfortunately, a couple of, uh, my dad passed away this year and then, and also my husband's father passed away. So my children lost their granddads. Um, and my nana passed away just recently. So it's been, um, uh, you know, it's been kind of, uh, yeah, this year it's been full on to begin with and then having, you know, like some family losses and, and grief um, has kind of, yeah, I've really been able to uh, appreciate that the the life that we've kind of created, like that nest that we're talking about, like making it a really great, cosy, comfortable, safe place to be. Um, I've been really thankful at times to, like to myself for thinking, oh, this always sounds silly, but there are moments where I'm really grateful and I think, oh, that's so cool because I remember that, you know, I bought like some new card game, like, you know how you just have things kind of, all over the house and when we were kind of in lockdown I was thinking oh yeah what are we going to do and like oh there's this card game or there's this board game or oh let's pull out the the piano like we have like an electric piano which is lovely to play as nice weighted keys and stuff and we put it away because no one's really playing with it. it's like oh cool we can pull that back out again and <laughs> like all those little things which over time it's just become natural if you see something interesting you grab it and maybe it's not interesting feel the time you kind of put it away and those things really helped when I was kind of feeling, you know, like things were hard or whatever. I was like, oh, yeah, I'm not really sure. But still knowing that I wanted to be, um, you know, present and available and, and playful and keeping things light to support my kids and myself and my husband as we, you know, went through some, you know, more challenging stuff, like being able to, yeah, I think I think still finding moments of gratitude and um, but being really uh, compassionate and patient with with like ourselves as parents, I think is really 
cool. Like we can we can give that to our kids, and sometimes it's harder to give to ourselves or you know other adults in our our life. So that's um, definitely been something that I've been learning about and getting better at, and it's really helped. But I think just having that really um, fantastic uh, life and um, being grateful for it. Like I know you hear people say um, sometimes, you know, they go through something difficult and then they appreciate, you know, all the um, like moments with their family even more. And I think I found that to be true. I just want to, you know, they like spend if possible even more time, you know, with my kids and and enjoying them and and things, which, you know, this year we've had a lot more of that because we've been home more. But it, it's been um, it's been it's been good. I mean, I love spending time with my kids. They're like some of my best friends and we have fun together doing, I don't know, just doing all kinds of things. Even just hanging out is fun. Like I just love like those little things. Like I'm like, you know, I may anyone want a cup of tea, you know, like I'll make a pot of tea and, you know, put some biscuits out or whatever and, you know, someone will come or not and we'll, you know, just sit down and chat and we'll be on our devices and like just sipping some tea and dumping our biscuits. And I was like, oh, I might be doing like some Duolingo. And I was like, oh, this is so funny. It wants me to say I am a cat, you know, and we'll have like a, a laugh and like just those little moments are really special. And the big stuff is cool as well. Like love like some of the, you know, cool big adventures we go on. But then those little things are really nice and just being um, yeah, like in the moment, like as you said, this moment is great. And knowing and having the um, like people like you and like Pam Sarish and Joyce, Meredith, Sandra, and, you know, the the kind of people who I see as like the, you know, have that that wisdom and have been through ups and downs and challenging times and not knowing if that was going, you never know what's going to happen for yourself, mm-hmm. but just knowing other people have been through it and that you know, we, that we can get through it and that unschooling is a really um, a great place to be in when, um, yeah, when things get a bit tough. And I think a lot of people have probably had that this year, hey. Yeah, no, I, I think that's a great point. And, yeah, that foundation that we're building that can, that it, I think it buoys us through those harder times. Like you said, you it, it's okay and it's so much easier I think or can be easier in unschooling families to find those moments of joy even in the hard spots even during the hard times right playing that card game for 15 minutes sitting down having that cup of tea in a conversation you know and just laughing over something that's passing through one of your lives in that moment you know those little connections um are, are just little bursts of energy, I think, um, so often in those challenging moments and just help you, yeah. even if, you know, 10, 15 minutes and you're like, oh, okay, you know, a little bit of weight off, a little bit of energy back, you know, to, you know, get back to processing because yeah. it's okay. Like that compassion you were talking about, right? It doesn't need to be, oh my gosh, I need to focus on this hard thing until I solve it or till I work oh, through yeah. it and then I can get back to my life. No, with yeah. unschooling, you're used to having more flow, that it's okay to have that laughter during hard times, those yeah. more fun yeah. moments, and, yeah. and, and reconnecting or connecting with each other yeah. really does so much there. And I think like all those little moments of connection that, that seem so small and simple every day, I really think that's often what helps the bigger moments be so fun too, right? Oh, yeah. because you're you're already connected and then this is just something super extra big fun that you're experiencing together you yeah. don't have to like be trying to reconnect at the same time you know what I mean right, yeah. so yeah no yeah. it's it, it's a beautiful lifestyle isn't it we'll just leave it there <laughs> yeah 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 we're very lucky I feel like very yeah so lucky to have to have found it you know and to be able to live this life how cool is it yeah, yeah. So right now, what is your favorite thing about your unschooling lives? Oh, oh gosh. Gotcha. <laughs> no. Um, oh, I don't know. Look, honestly, it's such a cliche, but just be able to spend time with these awesome people because they're so cool and so much fun. And oh, I don't know. It's like just having great relationships because that's life, isn't it? Like being able to have really good relationships with my kids 
and my husband, um, like our relationship is better than ever because being more generous and kind with our kids and then with ourselves and then with my husband, that's been, um, yeah, that, that's really great. I think it just sounds, yeah, like it's not that huge and exciting or anything, but it's just, yeah. That's, that's, time with that's people. it, right? That is the foundation in which everything else happens. Yeah. So, yeah, no, I love that so much. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me, Donna. That was so much fun. Thank you. I loved it. I loved it. I'm so glad that we're able to, I mean, meet. Can I say meet? <laughs> In, you know, on, yes. you know, online. <laughs> but, yeah, I mean, I've admired you for so long and so and got so much inspiration and everything out of what you write. Your books, I've got your books here mm. somewhere, and your podcast has been so, so helpful, you know, being able to listen to other parents whether it's you know new unschoolers and unschoolers been doing it for a while I've always got something out of their lives and so I'm really glad that you're able to do that for other people and share so generously thank you oh thank you so much that's beautiful (laughs) and I know you're helping unschoolers too where can people connect with you online I'm not I don't know I don't have much of an online presence I'm, I'm 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 on Facebook uh, but I kind of check in like once a month or something. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm pretty, I'm pretty slack, but I don't know. It's, it's, you know, sometimes I've got more time and then I could be on there more, but I really, there are some really great unschooling pages there. I get a lot of inspiration, like, um, unschooling. Oh no, I can't remember the names. Like there's Sandra Dodds page and there's what are some of the other ones. Oh, that's okay. You can send me some like, links and I can share them. If yeah. you no problem. Oh, people probably, I don't know if they can find me on Facebook. We're probably yeah. friends, aren't we? So they could probably, yeah. you know. Oh, definitely, definitely. I can, I'll share yeah. your Facebook page. And I'm sure people wouldn't expect an immediate reply. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody yeah. wants right. to connect. I love meeting new people and stuff. So, yeah, really happy to connect with other people, yeah. yeah. And, you know, we're unschooling first, right, with our families. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, mm-hmm. for sure. Well, that's beautiful. Thank you so much. And although I'll be off to bed soon, you have a wonderful day. Thank you. Have a good night. Sleep. <laughs> so fun. Thanks so much, Donna. Bye. See you later. Okay.